Okay, uh, welcome back, folks. Uh, uh, we're going to continue onwards, and I'm going to talk uh, briefly about history of computing software. I'm going to get my screen up here, and uh, we had a nice share during the uh, break by uh, Shell. Let's see if I can get it going here. There we go, there's the uh, hype curve and the uh, Hamming S curve side by side. And comparing those two is what the diagram was last time around. So there, that's definitely uh, worth embellishing on and commenting on. So feel free to put your points in there. Uh, next up, one of the things we found in the past week was that uh, Past two weeks was indeed we have uh, a couple of lectures missing in terms of our chapter slide sets, and there's two of them. Uh, one is uh, history of computer software, and the other is uh, I think chapter 18. It's far down, so uh, I wanted to say a few things about computer software, and then we're going to pick up in the next session. I have I have uh, progress. I have notes and I can uh, put them into slides now, but you don't have them in hand and we don't have slides, but I wanted to do something to offer. This has been offered on email, but just for trade. If anybody wants to grab that chapter and do the slide set, that's definitely a worthy uh, activity to do the template follow that we have and just try to capture the slides and where it goes. So uh, question, anybody want to raise your hand on that one? What is the due date for that? Whenever you're done, as usual with Hamming is you work it through. We can double back to it to your slides if you want them to. The earliest I have time for it is in the beginning of May when my thesis is with the advisor with the. Um... Yeah, so put your hand back down on that one. Yeah, yeah. Finish the thesis. Okay, uh, so I got it. And uh, I'll even update a bug on that one, an issue in Mantis. Okay, so let's just hit some of the high points for this lecture today. And uh, we'll save the, uh, get it back up on screen. This is computing software. Some of the high points uh, that are really fundamental and useful and uh, point out some connections that uh, may help you in your understanding of this chapter. And then we'll save the deep dive for a future time as we try to get the uh, schedule back in. Uh, first, I wanted to point out that, uh, am I sharing the screen right now? Let's see. And I'm sorry to keep asking that question, but uh, I don't always get positive feedback from the tools here. How about now? It's starting. It's showing. Okay, great. Um, uh, history of computing software. Um, first thing, what I thought was noticeable, uh, notable about this one is how just some of these storage mechanisms from before, punch card machines and paper tape and and even uh, physical devices made a difference in how how people looked at things. When I was uh, uh, going in high school, we actually had an IBM 1130 computer, which was interesting in that uh, it used uh, punch cards. And a punch card equaled, uh, for those who are not familiar, it equaled uh, 80 characters. 
and it used a thing called Hollerith code, which is a binary code of eight bits. Oh, uh, it sort of matches uh, ASCII, and you could type a line of it. So the way people wrote programs or occasionally documents was they would punch out cards, and they'd punch out, and so you'd have a physical manifestation of each thing that you did. And uh, it was interesting in how people measured the size of their programs because they wouldn't call it lines of code. That was actually a future sounding kind of notion. Uh, it was, well, how big's your program? And you know, hold up your hand and they have a rubber band. I need a bigger rubber band or it was really big. Uh, uh, you'd get a box. Oh, a box. And I think that was uh, 2000 cards, which is almost unimaginable. So we did a project of uh, doing a concordance of Hamlet, which was an interesting project. And it took uh, two and a half boxes, <laughs> which was interesting. At that time, the Navy was using uh, paper tape to uh, record, prepare, send messages. And what's notice, notable about these things is not that they're archaic, but I think the fact that they were physical manifestations of sorry, let me try it, physical manifestations of data. And I think that changed uh, how people looked at them. And um, so it's interesting when people have hands on. In fact, there was angst back in the day certainly when uh, Hamming was going to is, are we going to lose our programs? And um, that was important. So I'll, I'll wax poetic a little more on that when we get slide set. And uh, there you go. Next point I want to draw out for you and how it's different today in a, in a maybe unexpected way. Uh, he talks about one address and uh, two addresses, and at first they were absolute machine addresses for memory, absolute machine addresses for programs. Often never the twain would meet. Sometimes they would overlap. Assembly program is fairly arcane art. A uh, few people maybe do it today, but uh, how many people on this call have ever touched and, or looked at and, or perhaps even poked a, an assembly program? Uh, stop the screen so we can do a show of hands. Is it, is it zero? Nope, it's uh, one, two, three. Well, whoa, okay, okay, next question. We got a few. Are they teaching assembly to anybody these days? Not become an assembly programmer, but let's walk you through how you would use a symbolic language to represent computer memory and the instructions. Uh, CS is it just you guys are all overachievers or what? On the CS side is uh, low level with assembly. For yeah. CS 3140, That's low level it. programming too. Mm -hmm. Are you guys actually doing it? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay, interesting. And I, uh, I assume the motivator is maybe less historical and more, how do you get inside the guts of things, possibly from a cyber perspective? Exactly. Okay. So it's not just computer science appreciation, but how do you outflank network defenses and go someplace where they're not able to look because you're inside them? And figure out when somebody that's, else is doing anything to you. But yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's interesting uh, perspective. Um, uh, John and Lauren, you too, if you want to write a few groups about that, that we might add to the notes on this section about how assembly actually has a practical purpose today after a long period of being considered crazy town, that, that might be useful. So feel free to chime in on the uh, comment section of the lecture. Then, um, Here's another connection to the present I wanted to call out. One address, two address, relative addresses, um, uh, absolute binary and, and relative. Yeah, this was the origin of a lot of things called spaghetti code. 
it actually had a a predecessor when people were using cables to connect uh, boards together. Basically, it was like programming an ASIC chip uh, manually with wires, you know, breadboarding things, so you could put things together. It's kind of interesting. Uh, And then the progression of languages he describes in there about how it went that solves some of the relative addressing things. Uh, here's the interesting parallel to today. Uh, so I drop sync again as I should or not. I think what I'm going to do. Uh, note to self: I'm going to I'm going to bring up a second system next time. So I have an independent indication of what's going out over the, the video and hopefully that won't throttle my bandwidth so much and it slows things down. Um, so this is, this is worth using going through here, but not for the face value that you might think, but actually as we get to higher level languages and indeed higher level data representations, we're finding that a lot of these same patterns keep playing out. And uh, one active area, uh, let's say in the past decade is uh, semantic web stuff. How do we uh, label concepts? How do we refer to them? How do we do it in a globally unique way? How do we be unique yet independent of others and not step on each other's toes? Uh, uh, the semantic web stuff that we would think about for referring to concepts, naming concepts, relating concepts uh, in ways that are well-defined and some ways that are emergent and just come from keeping track of other people's ontologies, on other people's structured vocabularies, other people's just bookmarks and references. It's very interesting. And, uh, it utterly feels like the same journey of going from absolute addresses to relative addresses and so on and so forth, uh, as you see today. A slightly less esoteric, but just as important is if you're building a website that you want to be portable, you typically use relative URLs, and that way when it lives on a server, it still works. You need a couple of absolute links at the top, but you can grab the whole kit and caboodle and push that thing somewhere else, and it should just work again still. So, yet it's never quite perfect because you always need a, there are needs for absolute addressing and unique addressing and uh, relative addressing that exists not just in a computer data, not just in a computer instruction and information resources and conceptual resources. And as we get to higher and higher levels of abstraction, some might say sophistication or uh, um, uh, complexity, these patterns play out once again and again and again. So um, here's my takeaway on that. Any comments, please? You just described uh, three of the units we basically go over in the OS class, which is Peter talks about um, the the difference going going outside of main memory, going all the way up in towards the internet address space, roughly covering all of those things you did as parts of the overall real organization of how everything sits. Thank you, Don. There's John, some uh, good notes on that. About that right now. <laughs> well, I admire how you're not uh, getting the reflex uh, twitching from the pain. The body uh, mercifully has a good ability to forget pain. So some of those things are very hard when you're fighting your way through them. And it's reassuring to know that, oh, these are patterns of difficulty and achievement that are repeatable. Okay, let's go to the next section of this chapter. Um, This one again feels sort of like the history of computer science when you see this litany of languages. You see uh, 
chapter of prose coming across formula translation portfolio. Am I sharing? You yes, are. we see it. You're good. Okay, great. So, uh, Fortran evolved quite itself. It was quite common. Uh, if it sounds mysterious, it's not. If you, uh, a lot of student, engineering students at MTS, for example, use MATLAB or some other scripting kind of language where it's interpretive. You say, well, Y equals X squared plus two, and then you can type in a number and get a response. And, stretch it out into longer equations and matrices and pretty soon you're writing entire programs and that's very much looks like the original Fortran which is thrown into lots of different things. Um, um, I, I, John Backus uh, I believe was uh, the original developer of uh, Fortran and uh, after it, you know, waxed and waned and went away, people would ask him sometimes, uh, gee, what does the future of computer computing look like in the year 2000? What will the language be then? Because language design is still pretty new. He says, well, I don't know what it will look like, but we're going to call it Fortran. <laughs> His point being that these things just keep evolving, but the same patterns and even the same name. Sure enough, when I was at MPS in 2000, I was working with a student on uh, resurrecting some Fortran code to make it do the next thing, and all these old pathologies came right back to the forefront. Uh, uh, virtual machines is yet another concept that jumped out. Um, in the last 10 years, there's now a whole industry on it. People using virtual machines, they fought their way past specific machines and go on. Uh, so, uh, in fact, we had a, a guy graduate, he worked for uh, Puppet, and when, uh, how do you deploy software across virtual machines? Uh, big data, Hadoop, and other things have made this a um, uh, completely remarkable thing. Uh, the IT departments rarely care anymore what language something's written in. As long as it's behaving well with data exchange standards, they can spin up a new machine a new virtual machine somewhere in the local cloud, and then it's just doing things and talking other things. So a lot of the hard spots of back in the day in different languages um, have gone away or, or better. The friction is just not there that it used to be, but they've manifested itself in different ways. Uh, it's cool how a lot of these older problems just played out. So let's say, uh, let's jump to the finish line. And uh, let's say you're the author of some brilliant new thing. Well, I hope all of you guys, especially the ones finishing up your TCs, feel rightfully accused right now. And uh, um, since the beginning, he, Hamming said, well, it, it has to be easy to learn. When you hear him talking, it's it's not just for you. Can you learn it? But others learn it. Can they teach you how to learn it? So on. It has to be able to easy enough to use that you'll do actually use it. And oh, now we're thinking with the computer because you're using it. You're just doing it. You're not sitting down thinking I'm going to write a program, but rather you're you're thinking. Uh, uh, I'm now going to use my computer to think about this problem and help exploit those edge cases. Next is, uh, uh, can you debug it? Can you fix things? Oh my gosh, I can't tell you how much of our day when you realize it is spent trying to fix these errors. And as we'll see in error correcting codes, a lot of it is if you don't set it up in advance to either expect or avoid errors, then it can be very difficult. But if you can avoid errors in the first place, for example, the Python language, it doesn't, it makes it very hard to write something in an error. If you can't debug it, the errors are usually always the stuff we did not expect. And now how do we find it? You gotta be able to track that down and the practices to get there. Uh, 
that works not just at the software level, but at the user level and at the group level. And what the heck are we doing here? Can we tell if we're succeeding? Can we measure it? Can we know that it's working what we think we have? It's played out also in unit testing and extreme programming and other things. Um, I often wonder if some of the, these different disciplines that have sprung up, if people were listening to Hanning and just building this out. And then finally, the only thing to maybe object to in this list is, is use of the word subroutines. That was the jargon of the day. Uh, uh, basically, uh, subprograms, extensible programs, libraries, function libraries, uh, reusable code, uh, uh, all of those extra things. Can you extend your language? Okay, now uh, observation on this list. That's a pretty short list. Four things. He could only come up with four things that he would want computers to do. And I think uh, what's very cool, and he talks about it different ways, puts it apart, looks at it from different angles, puts it together again. I have trouble, here, here we are in 2020, I have trouble thinking of things so many years later that what's not on that list? Well, yeah, we've gone through many generations since then in software development and software organization and code development and team sport programming and big data chains and um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's at least 100 et cetera. Yet you can find almost everything you want in those four points. So that's going to be the other thing I try to communicate and this one, comments, questions on that. Okay, uh, one more thing that's worth noting in this chapter, because we're gonna see it again and I suspect one or two of you might have comments on this. Uh, if you have the chapter pulled up, search for the word redundancy. Redundancy, I'm gonna put it on the screen. Um, and it comes out at first by applied uh, APL. Uh, APL was a very funny language. They were teaching that uh, in uh, uh, my high school when I was there. They had an APL club. This was back in the early 70s. And, and Michelle, here's the, the highest possible compliment. Taught by the crazy, cool math teacher in high school who everybody liked. Because he was such a good guy. And he said, you know. And we you had people taking turns at the keyboard uh, with APL. And, and, oh, that was not a, an automatic thing. I mean, they had to shut down all other aspects of the lab because the computer only had one keyboard. They said, everybody else, go, go type some, punch some cards. Yeah, okay. And he gets there. And he had to put on the special overlay for every key because APL was – Unbelievably, it was it was clearly written by a mathematician. This is all math symbols and gradients, and they had five flavors of grad, and it just went on and on. And so, you were writing; it was like you were typing mathematical formulas. Only, perhaps, only a mathematician could love or grok or whatever. But um, it's also amusing that APL stands for A programming language. Uh, 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 I guess they wanted to get to the head of the line, something like that. And then finally, uh, uh, it wasn't until years later I realized this, but the APL language with all of its mathisms was so obscure that 
Well, I, I, today I call it's a write only language. Experts could write it, but I defy anybody to debug it and figure it out. And, and that's not a, new, a, a foreign notion to most people. Quick, quick show of hands. Who's tried to fix an Excel spreadsheet? Too many times. Yeah, many, many times. Uh, was it easy? I have a special skill at it. I can fix somebody's Excel spreadsheet over a telephone. Wow, that's unbelievable. Uh, maybe a, easily a resume bullet, but uh, because it's obscure, it's hard to read. So write only, it's so many ways. It's not a language designed for debugging. Let's say that. Because maybe people didn't even think of it as a programming language at first, but indeed, it's a language. So, so here are uh, some points to take away. Uh, the provocative one then is our spoken language tends to be about 60% redundant. See if I can get my screen to behave. It's not behaving. Uh, I've got an off by one line to highlight error. Okay, our spoken language tends to be 60% redundant, while written language is around 40%. Oh, oh, this is why it's so hard to write a book describing how people talk. This is why screenplays, when you read them, you go, why do they talk in such a weird fashion? But then you hear them talking in the, in the video and they go, um, Oh, yeah, that's that's very natural. What natural dialogue flowing. Okay, so uh, I offer this as, if nothing else, some comfort to you writing your, finishing your thesis right now, perhaps in a foreign language. We go, oh, yeah, I'm writing and uh, speaking aren't even the same, yet nobody realizes it. So... Uh, I'll offer to you that uh, you get to exercise a whole nother part of your brain if you read out loud what you write. And redundancy or no, if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. But you've got a fighting chance if you can read it out loud to yourself or to others or from somebody else and they go, oh, okay, I understand what you said in that sentence. I don't know what the heck you're talking about, but that sentence sounds okay. It's pretty interesting that uh, having connected the two, the ability to understand was closely related to redundancy. And uh, so the reinforcement within a concept to help people understand it, particularly if they get something a little bit wrong at first, then they push through it and get it ready to go. Okay, comments on language and redundancy, please. I think that's what inspired him eventually for his codes, his error correcting codes. Because he saw people could do that on the fly without thinking about it. So there should be a way to somehow build some form of redundancy into a data stream so that machines could do something similar. You still with us, Marty? Let's hold that thought, uh, uh, Lauren. And uh, actually, maybe thanks to Michelle, we don't have to hold that thought. Why don't you pose that as a comment in the uh, as a forward pass to the error correcting codes chapter and say, was Hemming's thinking on forward error correcting codes influenced by the notions of redundancy and spoken and written language or vice versa? That it wasn't until he realized differences, um, the fundamental nature of redundancy and correcting errors that he noticed or cross-connected it to how we speak and how we write. 
I've said that very verbosely and poorly. That would make an awful comment, but hopefully there's enough redundancy in how I said it that we can give ourselves that forward pass and get it later. I think I have about 60% of it. <laughs> I think I have about 60% of it, which should allow me to write it out at a 40% rate. I'm putting a comment in now. Cool. All Come right. On. Outstanding. And we'll challenge the... Uh, the biographer, uh, Dr. Mandelberg, with the cause and effect of uh, what came first, the redundancy or the correction. All right, any other parting shots today? Okay, thank you. Enjoy the videos, enjoy the chapters. That is by far the, uh, the meat and the value of this course. See you next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye. See you next week.